Well, hello there, everyone. This is Clint Finney again for another virtual pasture walk for June the 25th, 2020. This month, we're excited to take you to the farm of Ron and Debbie Host, just outside Bowerston, Ohio, here in the heart of Harrison County. Uh, this is a farm we've been waiting to take you all to for several years, uh, but because of some oil and gas uh, pipeline work, uh, they haven't felt that the farm was quite ready for y'all to see until here just recently. So this made the perfect location for us to be able to go out and highlight the practices and the grazing that they've done on their operation. So let's get started. Ron and Debbie purchased this farm somewhere around 2013. One of those things that when you go out and, and do the videos and, and talk with them, we've worked with them for a long time, but we forgot to ask them exactly when it was that they purchased the farm. But uh, this farm was owned by Ron's grandparents and great grandparents uh, back to the late 1800s. So they're a, a generational type of operation. It was owned by a cousin uh, in the interim there, but always has been owned by the host family. So kind of uh, interesting that they get to carry on the tradition of owning this property. And Ron and, Ron and Debbie are retired. And so this is kind of their retirement project as they go forward. And so our first visit was in 2014. Um, Beth and, and Chris Katula, our longtime civil engineering technician, went out there to look around and, and talk with them about grazing because they had started attending our Eastern Ohio grazing pasture walks and uh, we're, we're interested in, in making grazing work on our, their operation. And as we get started here with, with this video, also I'll throw in a disclaimer here. Um, we, we went out and we shot these videos and, and having no idea how they were really gonna fit and work in with each other. So at times we're gonna be kind of jumping around a little bit, but we wanted to make sure we got everything talked about while we were out there, uh, just, just be able to cover and do justice to their farm and, and the great improvements that they put in on their operation. Just kind of wanted to give you an overview of the farmstead and I think we'll do the same thing hopefully on the other side kind of to see what they deal with as far as the hills and the elevation and the changes and the water and how things work and of course we'll do that uh, on the pasture walk with, with still pictures as well but the other thing to look at up here the immense amount of work that, that they've put into this place and how much it's changed over time and we're, we'll show you a, a picture of what the farm looked like before they came and what it looks like now. And then also, uh, we're going to talk about the pipelines that have went through this farm and how oil and gas has changed the landscape out here and some of the benefits of having the pipelines come through and sure we'll talk about some of the negatives of having the pipeline come through it and oil and gas in general just how it's affected our grazing world here in eastern ohio but a good shot just to show the elevation i know we've got folks that watch these pasture walks from all over the place and you know we're dealing with a lot of elevation change it's a couple hundred feet in elevation from top to bottom here at this farm and, and they've got different watering systems that water both sides but it, that's a part of the challenge of grazing cattle in eastern Ohio is, is the extreme elevation changes that we have to deal with. We're on the total opposite end of the farm on the other side, uh, looking down again to show you elevation changes. See the pond there, they've got it fenced out and the stream below the pond's fenced out all the way down. This side of the farm has pressurized water. This was kind of the original part that we worked on to try to get it up and going. The other side had a really good spring before the pipelines came through. It still has a spring, not as good as it was before, but still does have a spring. But uh, they pressurize water all the way up here. I talked about how, how many, it's hundreds of feet in elevation. All comes from a spring down by their house. Uh, and then they've got a, a backup spring that they developed uh, a couple of years ago. And, and that serves a good purpose. And we talk about this when we go out to farms and try to lay out paddock divisions. If, if they've got a spring that we can use and we can develop, it's a good emergency backup kind of system to have a spring that's developed. So if the power goes out, if we run out of water, if the pump blows up, whatever, we've got a gate that we can open and let cows or whatever grazing livestock we have get to that, that water that's always gonna be there. Most of the time the spring's frost free too. So if we get an extended freezing event or frost free waters freeze up, we've got a place to be able to turn uh, cattle to or like grazing livestock to. And then while we're up here, I guess I'm gonna have Beth pan just a little bit and show us the, the frost free water. That frost free water sits in the border between their pasture field and what they consider their hay field. Now I'll contend that that's 
pastureland too. It's just that they make hay off of it. Uh, so this time of year, when we've got way too much forage that we don't have, we can't manage it all. That's a good field to be able to take hay off, and then they can use it again late September, October, November. They do fall calve here. Uh, just to give you a little insight into fall calving. So this is the kind of field they can use at the around, at or around the time they're calving. Um, so that's about four acres. It doesn't cover all their hay need. They've got to buy some hay, and, and that's okay too. You know, it, it's still a management part of their operation. It's a part of the forage that they can take off as hay and not have so much extra forage to have to manage this time of year. So this is a, a picture of the pressurized water system there there from the video before uh, and, and we apologize for that video being a little jerky but uh, we we're having some trouble with the tripod at the moment and we want to make sure we got it uh, taken but this is the pressurized system of course uh, of their operation this would be the south side of the road uh, and this is kind of the, like I said the first section that we sort of worked on all the water comes from a spring development, old milk house kind of spring development down by the barn. And um, this this water system is then put in the pastures exactly where we need it to be. Uh, we talked about having emergency spring development they can turn turn animals into. Uh, but this was the, the first and original system and, and been a, a very reliable system. We talk about, we've talked many times about spring developments and and how we can't always get them where we want them. Uh, but with pressurized water, we're able to put this water way up here on top of the hilltop and, and be able to water that field that they use for hay and then for grazing later on in the season. And then this is the north side of the road. Um, this is a gravity fed spring. And, and this spring was put in uh, prior to the pipelines going through the farm. And, we're going to talk more about the pipelines here in a few slides. Uh, but when the pipelines went through, they, they sort of ruined the flow on this spring. And so it's not flowing the quantity of water that it was flowing before. Uh, we, we surmise that the, the pipeline work kind of ruined the rock strata and the, the water is now following the oil and gas pipeline and, and going to a lower elevation. So they've kind of let these areas settle for a few years in hopes that that spring would come back. And there's some minor wet spots, but um, it, it's really not come back to the level that it was before. And so this side of the farm, they're now gonna put a, a pressurized water system up into this trough and try to use this trough the way that it is. But also they bought some additional property uh, that wouldn't be watered by this spring anyway. So they have to get water to it. And, and so a pressurized system just to kind of fix up this whole uh, side of the road is kind of in order. The other thing to, to point out, and, and I know we jump around here a lot with these videos, but we'll talk about the pipelines in a moment, but because they've got the oil and gas pipelines around their farm, they've got to be concerned about what they can and can't do as far as burying water lines. So some of this pipeline will probably have to be on top of the ground because they got so many pipelines in such a small area, it would be almost impossible to be able to cross them. So they're they're looking at you know can they bury parts of it can they can they keep parts of it above the ground and and what can they use and what can they not use and so those are, are good options to consider uh, for any operation really is do, do we really need that pipeline to be buried can it be on top of the ground and still serve the purpose that we're looking for if we're not looking for a pipeline during the winter in any way, uh, a pipeline on top of the ground and overall is going to be cheaper. And I can guarantee you, you can put a pipeline out through pasture like they have there. And within a year or two, you won't be able to find it because the forage will have grown over top of it. Uh, and it's not going to be in your way for mowing or, or moving tractors through the fields. I know we, we talk so much about gas pipelines uh, in, through this whole presentation, but it's such a large part of their operation and what they've had to go through over the last several years. And Beth and I thought it would just be a great idea to include the side-by-side -side comparison aerials of before and after when we started working with them. And then, then now that's a 2015 aerial, I believe, and a 2019 aerial. And that just shows you how much their operation has changed as far as how much of the timber has disappeared, uh, how, how much extra pasture they have gained. 
and um, the changes that we've had to go through as far as our plan practices and, and putting fences in and, and doing the things that we wanted to do for grazing back in 2014 and 15 uh, didn't really work once the pipelines were all over. So we've had to replan and remanage and, and do things differently, uh, kind of roll with the punches as the pipelines came through. One of the things we wanted to highlight out here at Host is uh, the diversity that they're seeing. And, and we're seeing a lot of diversity this spring anyway. I think it's partially to do with the weather patterns and things that we've had the past few years. But uh, here we've we've got some birds for tree foil. We've got lots of white clover. We've got red clover. We even saw an alfalfa plant there coming up the hill. Some alcyke um, and then the different grasses. Uh, seen a lot of plantain here and there. Some other forbs. But really good diversity as far as legumes and right now we're standing on this is the last pipeline to come through and Ron is a beekeeper so part of what he'd done with the pipelines was was get them to plant back mixes that were bee friendly that had some flowering legumes in them that were also going to be beneficial to the pasture and so this this as I said is the last pipeline to come through it's still got a lot of recovery to do but this is well recovered from what it was before it was hard to get anything to grow here and we've got some still pictures from the other pipelines and, and where they've recovered to at this point but um, very good diversity at this farm and that's something that they've been working on and and you'll see that some of this white clover is now starting to go to seed I've pulled some seed heads here and, and we're getting some green seed out of it that'll, that'll just go back into the seed bank and, and become clover in other places the cows will eat that, carry it to other parts of the farm. The wind will blow it, the birds will eat it, they'll carry it to the other parts of the farm. So this will add a lot of diversity to the rest of their operation. Here again, a before and after kind of photo. We dug through our files and, and found some before photos. These were taken, in the before photo there in the winter was taken in 2015. That's after the first pipeline went through. And then there's a second one that's come through since then. Uh, but just kind of shows you, A, the, the difference in the landform a little bit, but also the, the, the past improvements, the big improvements that the hosts have made at our operation and, and fixing up some of the old outbuildings and, and a new building and a new pond down there below and, and, and how much uh, work that they've put into this operation over the years, even with all the oil and gas pipelines going in around them. I wanted to talk just a minute to while we're on the gas pipeline topic about some of the, of course, detriments of, of having the pipeline come through, but possibly some of the benefits uh, of having a pipeline come through. I mean, we, we all, given the choice, probably don't want a pipeline to come through our grazing system, at least, because it creates whole new issues about making cows cross that pipeline while they're there, putting a new pipeline in. And, uh, it's going to just change our farm in, in general and and also you know we talk about soils and soil health and what that does to the soil that where that pipelines went through and uh, our old soil scientist Doc Redman used to say once disturbed always disturbed and that's kind of true with a pipeline um, they're going to dig up ground they're going to compact soil uh, those are changes that are going to be hard to correct although they're not impossible to correct uh, but in the end uh, this pipe, these pipelines have come through and, and they've taken out some, some brushier areas. Uh, of course, they've taken out some timber as well, but uh, they've, they've added five more acres of pasture about to the, to the operation. And, and if that's your goal, then, then that's okay too. And then one of the things that Ron pointed out was that with each, with each pipeline, um, they had to fence the pipeline out. The, the pipeline company had to do that. And so Ron was able to get them to leave some of the fences or parts of the fences to be able to use as his permanent division fences through the property. So uh, I guess it's it's not all bad that the pipelines went through. Uh, they've been able to take lemons and make lemonade, so to speak, and, and make the pipeline kind of work for them. Of course, they, they lost that one spring up above, and so they've got to do some other things for water. But uh, and I wouldn't go as far as to say that the pipelines have really improved the operation as a whole, but it's something that we can live with and something that we can change it and make better for the operation. We wanted to show you as we're talking about pipelines and, and what we go through. We had a video there from the first 
or the, the latest pipeline to go through. This pipeline, Ron tells me, went through in the late 70s. And, and it's almost completely recovered. If it hadn't been for the gas line marker poles here, I, I wouldn't have known that it was a, a gas line other than it's straight and down the hill. But just to show you that life does go on, it does get better, it will regenerate, especially if we're doing a good job of grazing, we can turn a field around and, and make it come back. And we get that same question with the reclaimed soils, the places that have been mined for coal, you know, are they ever going to recover, are they ever going to get back? And the answer to that is maybe sometimes they don't. Sometimes, depending on management, it, it's all in management and how we manage the area and whether it's going to recover and come back. But this one has recovered probably 90 some percent back to, to its original state uh, after having a pipeline put through it. Some diversity, red clover. I forgot to mention medic the last time. We've seen a lot of medic or hop clover out here too. So, uh, really good. Uh, picture. This is a new part of the farm, kind of later addition purchase. We've got some water issues to work through up here. It's, it's really high up and we need to be able to put pressurized water up here because there's no natural spring, but a uh, very good field. Ron tells me when the cows get here, it's hard to get them out of it except for they have to go somewhere else for water. So just to show you how, how much a pipeline can change and can get better. He says that it, over the, the time they've been here, they've gained about five acres of pasture because the pipelines have went through some of the wooded areas. When we were out riding around with Ron, um, I, I kind of picked this spot out and, and said, for Beth to take a picture of it, just because it shows a, a massive amount of diversity there in, in the field. And, and I know Ron's been listening to what we were talking about because he was like, yeah, it's, it's really diverse. And, and hang on, there, there's an even better spot when we get up further on the hill. So we went up and we shot the video that eventually made it into this presentation. But uh, that that part up there was very diverse as far as legumes go and for honeybee habitat. But this site was more of what I was looking at for, from a pasture standpoint for diversity. Uh, of course, there's some weeds in there. We're going to talk about those weeds here in a few minutes. But, you know, I can see orchard grass and fescue, and there's some velvet grass there, which we all know isn't all that great for forage. But it's a good ground cover, and it's a, a good mulch because the cows won't eat it, but they will walk it into the ground, and, and it'll serve a purpose to soil health. There's good red clover and white clover. If we looked hard, we'd see some alfalfa. I see some buckhorn plantain, some dandelion, some other things in there. Just a, a good picture of diversity. And, and over the, the entire farm, the, their pasture fields sort of look like this. They've got really good diversity put into their grazing system. As promised, we're going to talk here a little bit about weeds. And uh, by, by all means, this isn't meant uh, for Ron and Debbie to, to worry about the weeds that we found out there. But it, it's just something I thought would be good to bring up. And just to give you a little teaser, um, Beth's putting together a Thursday web presentation on pasture weeds that we'll be putting out here in the next couple of weeks. But the, these two weeds kind of right here together um, are probably my problem weeds in pastures at home. I can even see some other ones in there. There's some yarrow and some other things that aren't really an issue, but uh, ironweed and horse nettle, uh, these two are, are probably the ones that I get the most calls or we talk the most about when it comes to pasture weeds. And they're the ones that, that that I guess I get concerned about the most out there uh, just because these two are perennials and so they can cause us more issues as time goes by. So we'll talk about them sort of individually. Horse nettle uh, is, a, as I said, a perennial. It, it'll produce a little sort of yellow tomato looking berry on, on the plant. It's got spines on it, especially on the stem. They hurt stickers that hurt uh, if you get them in your fingers. Um, and this weed is considered poisonous, although I, I hate to even mention that because I don't see livestock eating enough of it to ever cause them any harm. Uh, I have it in fields where we have sheep and the sheep will nibble at it, uh, but it doesn't seem to ever affect them. So uh, don't don't get concerned about it because it's poisonous per se. Uh, in a grazing system, we, we won't probably have enough of it out there to cause us any issues and also hopefully our livestock aren't hungry enough to have to eat that either um, but for the most part uh, this one will, will kind of take over a pasture field because uh, we go through we graze an area and then that they the livestock don't eat the horse nettle and it, it tends to then really flourish and so 
eventually it'll kind of look like it's covering the whole pasture field. Like you can graze livestock through it and they won't touch that horse nettle. And next time it looks even worse. It, it looks like tomato plants out there in the field eventually if, if we keep grazing through it. So uh, kind of a problem. Ironweed, we all know, um, is is out there in our pasture fields. A lot of us have ironweed. Ironweed doesn't really cause me any grief other than that it's just there. Um, it's a really thin stock, really thin leaf. Uh, really doesn't take up that, that much sunlight. In the end, I think of ironweed as if it's got that much height above ground, think about how much root it's got below ground and it's bringing up nutrients that I wasn't able to use with my pasture anyway, for the most part. So uh, I, I look at it sometimes as it might even be a benefit, but I can tell you it's darn aggravating at 10 miles an hour on an ATV once that stuff's seeding out and, and you get dusted with the seeds as you drive over it trying to move cows or build fence or whatever. So uh, that, and if for that reason, that's why ironweed gets on one of my, my hated weed lists. Um, I just wanted to bring these two up because these are two indicators of uh, overgrazing. And I, I don't I don't bring that up and, and say that for, for Ron and Debbie or any of you to say, oh my gosh, uh, you mean I'm overgrazing if I've got these weeds? No, it, it, they're, they're, they're legacy plants. So they, they've shown up because of an overgrazing event. I mean, they, and they could show up for any other reason for that matter too. But if we've got a lot of them, typically it's because at some point we've had an overgrazing event or an extended overgrazing event on that field. And, and this field at Ron and Debbie's was, was used for horses. And so we have to figure that when it was overgrazed and that's where these weeds have come from. And uh, I, this is kind of selfish for me, but I, I bring these two up because I didn't have a problem with horse now specifically. We always had ironweed, but um, until the last several years, and I partially I think it's because of the weather patterns we've had, but partially it's made me take a, a long, hard look at our grazing system and figure out what we were doing maybe wrong. And, and and I thought, you know, there's no way that I'm overgrazing anything at any point. I'm moving cows every 12 hours. And when I went back and took a long, hard look, no, I, I really was. I, I was overgrazing things, especially early in the spring, late in the fall. And even moving cows every 12 hours, there was times I would slip up and not give them an, enough area. And so they were overgrazing it and sometimes severely. But I was leaving that field for 25, 50, 90 days to recover. And so it, it, it didn't show that the overgrazing was really hurting the forage in any way, but these weeds were the indicator plant that I was doing. And so what I've done now is kind of go back and leave more residue for each pass and, and not let them uh, take too much and, and blast too much of that area so that we don't get these weeds. And, and just this summer, I've noticed that my, my horse nettle population has went way down. So just in case some of you are seeing those and, and just to give you a little teaser to be looking for that weeds presentation to be coming out here real soon. Kind of an interesting part of their operation is they've got a county road that splits the farm in two. And uh, I personally have that at my house too. And so we get questions all the time of how do you do that? How do you get cows to go back and forth across the road? And the answer to that is the cows learn and they get trained to do it. And they will do it by themselves. I was telling Ron that I came home one night and the cows were on the wrong side of the road. And I asked my dad, why'd you move the cows across the road? And he said, I didn't. They got out and they moved themselves. They're, they're just used to it. But one of the ways that I found and they found the same thing is kind of the best way to get them across is to have kind of this alley or uh, we got, it goes by many names. Dad calls it a leg, but we just kind of bring them into this leg. And so that way when we have calves, baby calves, we can make sure we get everybody in the leg. We can feed them something here, give them some mineral, whatever, to kind of hold them here, get the calves in. And then once you open that gate, they're all here to be able to go across. And as we were talking here today, he said, I want the same thing on the other side of the road. And I experienced the same thing at my house. We have a good alley on one side of the road, have nothing on the other side. And I tell dad all the time, we have to have that alley on the other side. So, you know, a county road, even a state road, isn't that huge of a challenge. I mean, the cows learn, it, it, the whole operation for us takes all of five minutes. It, it does take two people, one to stand on each side of the road and make sure that they go because the cows will get out here on the road and they'll go up the road ditch and back if you don't do that. But, and there's even times I've done it by myself and just strung a piece of poly wire across both sides and make sure you get the traffic stops. But if you've got a county road or 
some other obstacle to have to go through. The, the cows eventually learn. It's just making it easy and making it manageable for that time when we have calves. We had some technical difficulties with the camera there that last video. Um, we were having trouble getting into pan one way and the other. So just wanted to quickly show you the, the opposite side of the road. And, and so this blue gate opens. The other blue gate on the other side, of course, opens. And that's how they move cows back and forth and across the road and of course while we were there talking ron was talking about how you know how we can make this better how, how can we do this better and they've got another set of gates further on down the road here that they don't use for rotating them back and forth and i said you know it wouldn't be the end of the world too if you used the the rotation they kind of come across here going one way and they, they go across the other set of gates and, and down the road a ways to get the other side and that way they kind of make a full rotation of the farm we don't always talk about it, everything being nice and pretty and making a full rotation because there are times that we overgraze a field maybe a little bit and we need to skip one. So we, we tend to not talk about making nice, pretty rotations, always following one pasture after the other because we don't want to get set in that kind of rut where we always do that. But in the case of rotating the cows across the road, it is nice to have two different locations to be able to send them across one way and bring them back another and for me the reasoning behind that is i can keep a, a section of grass on one side and the other at two different locations and when we calve uh, i can bring the cows and calves up maybe 12 hours before i know we're going to make that move to that section of ungrazed grass and that that allows those cows to bring the calves up into that field so I don't have to go looking for them because if they're in a pretty big pasture the day before they need to go or the, right at the time they need to go across the road sometimes finding all the calves and getting them all together is sort of like herding cats uh, you, you can't get them all headed in the right direction at the same time so uh, having two or three different locations where we cross the road at home uh, makes it easier because I can keep a little patch of grass here or there to be able to bring cows up and make sure the calves come along but uh we also talked in the video about him wanting to put a another alleyway on the other side of the road and, and down the road there they've got another alley that's on the opposite side of the road so it would lend itself good to kind of make that rotation uh without having to build an extra alley on this side but uh if you're, you're thinking about crossing the road or thinking about doing something like this like i said it's one of the best things we ever did was build like a hard alleyway to be able to get the cows in uh, i put poly wire on one end of it so the calves can come in they can come and go as they please and if we have to hold the cows on there for an hour or two before they go across that's perfectly fine we got all done um riding around the farm and hadn't seen a cow and it's because they were in a pasture that we didn't have to go through hadn't to get close to and uh, beth and i both said can, can we see the cows can we go see the cows because we know that you all appreciate um, seeing the cow herd and, and, and how they look and what they are and, and where they're at. And uh, I, I guess that some people call Ron and Debbie's place the country club because their cows are always in great condition. You can see that nice oily streak line down the back of that black cow there, the red cows too, uh, all in really good condition in good flesh uh, for fall calving cows there. They'll start, I think they said in September, Kevin, um, in mostly red Angus, black Angus type influence cows. Uh, they've, they've only got a key few cows and, and that's perfectly fine uh, because as Ron said, you know, he, he's interested in, in beekeeping and, and he's interested in being retired and living on the farm that his grandfathers and great grandfathers before them owned and and cows for them are a lot uh recreational and, and vegetation management more than anything else um, debbie enjoys the cows i know because she was up there giving them some feed to be able to bring them down here for us to get a picture of and i'm not saying they don't enjoy them they do uh, what i'm saying is that the cow herd is, is vegetation management it helps keeps a farm clean uh it, it's a recreational opportunity for them as well to go out and enjoy the farm and and see it on a day-by-day -day basis and, and see how the cows are affecting the quality of forage and the, the land that they're they're choosing to manage so uh just wanted to work in some quick cow pictures so that all of you uh, would be able to see the cows and, and know that there are cows there well i'm proud to have a picture here with uh ron you don't know that i i don't have 
a picture of myself in the pasture walk videos, but this picture brings up a, a really good point. Um, this is uh, on the edge of their concrete heavy use pad, and they chose to put in a concrete heavy use pad because they wanted to keep the area cleaner than a gravel pad would allow them to do. And, and that's something uh, we have to talk with producers when they want to put in a winter feeding system of any kind, what material is going to fit them the best. Uh, a gravel pad is probably only going to get cleaned once or twice a, a winter or else we'll tear up the gravel and get into the base. A concrete pad can be cleaned a lot more often. Um, this pad has an access road that comes up from the buildings down below, has a frost free water there on the other side of the side by side. Ron and Debbie have built a building on the end of the heavy use pad that they store all their hay in. It's got a lean to on the side of it that they can allow animals access to if they need to. Um, and they've got a, a really good winter feeding operation here at their place. But while we're talking about winter feeding, um, while we were out there, Ron was talking to us about now that the pipelines are all put back and they're growing forage, we really need to get a better handle on what is sustainable for them as far as how many cows they can keep at their place all the time. And one thing that we'll be talking with them about is uh, stockpiled forage. And, and can we get some areas of stockpiled grass to help lessen their need of purchased hay? And uh, their fall calving cows, we've talked about fall calving cows needing higher quality forage. And, and we all have talked several times about how stockpiled forage typically is equal or better quality than the hay we get made in Eastern Ohio. And, and, and along with this, you know, I talked in the last slide with the cows about the, the cows for them largely being recreational and, and uh, vegetation management, but, but Ron and Debbie are concerned about profitability. They're concerned about, you know, how much it takes to, to be able to purchase hay. And Ron has a number that he, he knows that it takes this many calves to be able to purchase the hay to get through the winter. And, so they are concerned about profitability. So stockpiled forage is, is something that we'll, we'll be talking with them about uh, in the future, especially as we talk about how many cows they can sustain on their operation. And, and from, from our perspective, you know, we work with a lot of producers on winter feeding operations and design and winter feeding operations for their cow herds or for their livestock. And, and if we can put stockpiled grass in, we alleviate a lot of the problems that we, we create with winter feeding systems. And that's not to say that Ron and Debbie aren't doing a great job. They are, they've got a great winter feeding system. It's environmentally sound. You know, they're, they're able to manage things very, very easily as far as winter feeding goes. But I'm sure they'd be the first to admit that, that they'd be glad to have some stockpiled grass to help lessen their need on purchased hay and to lessen their need on hay in general, maybe to get some better quality forage out there for the cows that they have right now. Uh, so something that we'll be talking with them in the future as we talk about the cow numbers that they can have there at their place. Well, that's a wrap for this month's virtual pasture walk. We'll end as always by thanking our sponsors and also a deep and heartfelt sincere thank you to Ron and Debbie Host for agreeing to have us out and uh, go over their farm and for taking us around on the side by side so we could get great pictures and great views and talking with us uh, about their operation and the journey they've kind of been on and all the things that they've learned at our pasture walks over the past several years and been able to implement their, on their, their operation. We sure do appreciate it. Be looking for another web presentation to come out next Thursday and also updated information on when we'll be able to get back together again. But for now, we'll see you next time.